Hello and welcome to Data Science for Everyone. Today we'll talk about Python functions. Let's get started. Let's create a function to find the cube of a number. To create a function, we use the keyword def, give it a name, in this case cube, and then add parenthesis and a colon. This first line is called the function header. The indented lines beneath make up the function body. Here, the cube function raises 3 to the power of 3. When we call cube, the result is 27. Right now our function has no parameters. We'll add those next. Right now the function only ever cubes 3. But what if we wanted to cube any number? We add a parameter inside the parenthesis. Here, the parameter is number. The function now works with whatever value is passed in. When we call the function, the values we provide are called arguments. We can now call any number such as 5 and get the cube by calling this function. Instead of printing the result directly, sometimes we want the function to send back a value that can be stored or used later. We do this by using the return keyword. In this version, our cube function sends back the cubed result. We can store the result in a variable like num and then use it however we want. When writing functions, it is important to describe what they do. That's where doc strings come in. A doc string is placed right after the function header, inside triple quotes. It explains what the function does without having to read through all the code. For example, our cube function's doc string clearly states, return the cube of a number. This makes the code easier to read and maintain. Now we'll take a step further, passing multiple arguments into functions. Instead of just squaring a number, let's create a function that raises one number to the power of another. This requires two parameters in the function header rather than one. I have named the function power with parameters base and exponent. When we call power 2, 3, the first argument 2 becomes the base and the second argument 3 becomes the exponent. The function then computes 2 to the power of 3, giving us 8. Notice that the doc string now explains what the function does. Functions can also return more than one value using something called a tuple. A tuple is similar to a list in that it can group multiple values together. The key difference is that a tuple is immutable. Once created, its values cannot be changed. Lists use square brackets while tuples uses parentheses. We can also unpack tuples, meaning we can assign each element to a different variable in a single step. In this example, the tuple 4, 5, 6 is unpacked into the variables a, b and c, which now store 4, 5 and 6 respectively. Just like lists, tuples uses zero-based indexing. That means the first element is at index 0, the second at index 1, and so on. In this example, we can access the second element y using index 1. Now let's update the behavior of our function to return two values instead of one. Here, the function swap powers not only calculates a raised to the power b, but also b raised to the power of a. Both results are packed into a tuple and returned as shown. Let's dive into the concept of scope. Scope determines where in a program a variable or function name can be accessed. Every variable or function name has certain boundary within which it exists. There are three key types of scope. Global scope, which is defined outside of any function and is available across the program. Local scope, which is defined inside a function, only alive while the function is running. And built-in scope. These are names that come with Python by default, like print or length. In this example, the variable value is created inside the function. Once the function finishes running, that variable no longer exists. Trying to print value outside the function fails because it only lived in the local scope of that function. Here, num equals to 10 is defined as a global scope, so it can be accessed anywhere inside or outside the function. Inside the square function, we define a local variable called n equals to 2. 
this variable only exists within the function. When we call square, Python uses local n, and so the output is 100. Outside the function, n does not exist, so print n causes an error. The global variable num is still accessible and prints correctly. What happens is that Python first checks the local scope for a name, and if it is not found, it looks outward to the global scope. Here is another example. The function square uses the global variable num because it's not defined locally inside the function. Notice that if we change num later on after defining the function, the new value is used the next time we call the function. Python searches in the local scope first, then in the global scope, and finally in the built-in scope if the name is not found. If we need to modify a global variable inside a function, we must explicitly declare it with the global keyword. Otherwise, Python assumes we are creating a local variable. In this example, we are modifying the variable counter by appending the global keyword, and therefore calling the function increment updates the global counter variable as expected. Now that we are comfortable with both local and global scope, let's go one step further and talk about nested functions where one function lives inside another. If a function is defined inside another function, Python searches for variables in a fixed order known as the LEGB rule where L is the local scope, which are variables defined inside the current function, E is the enclosing scope, where the variables are from any enclosing or outer functions, G is the global scope, which are variables defined at the top level of the file or module, and B is the built-in scope, which are names that are part of Python itself. Python will look for the variable name and stop as soon as it finds a match. This rule explains why nested functions can access variables defined in their enclosing functions. Let's look at some examples. In this example, inner is defined inside outer. When inner runs, it looks for x. Python checks the local scope of inner first, and x is not found. Next, it checks the enclosing scope, which is outer, and it finds the value of x. That's why the output of outer function is enclosed. This demonstrates E in LEGB rule, which is that variables can be inherited from enclosing function if not found within the function. So why bother nesting functions? One big reason is to avoid repetition. Suppose we want to write a function that doubles three numbers called process underscore numbers. In the first version, we repeat times two for each argument. This works, but it's repetitive and harder to change if the logic gets more complex. By defining a helper function called process inside the process underscore numbers function, we only write the doubling logic once and reuse it. This makes the code cleaner, easier to read, and easier to maintain. Since process is only useful inside process underscore numbers, Nesting it keeps the helper function hidden from the rest of the program. Let's look at another example. Let's say we want to compute the squares of numbers. On the left, we directly compute the squares inside the loop. Now, let's improve it. Instead of repeating the squaring logic, we define a helper function called square inside the outer function called transform underscore list. As we can see, the nested function avoids repeating code if squaring is needed multiple times. Another powerful use of nested functions is returning functions themselves. In this example, the function power underscore creator returns a new function each time it's called. Calling power underscore creator2 gives us a square function, and power underscore creator3 gives us a cube function. Notice how each return function remembers the value of n that was originally passed into the power underscore creator function. This behavior, where an inner function remembers variables from its enclosing scope even after the outer function is finished, is called a closure. Closures are extremely useful when we want to customize behavior of a function 
while avoiding repetitive code. When working with nested functions, we sometimes want the inner function to modify a variable defined in the outer function. The non-local keyword solves this problem. It lets the inner function update a variable from the nearest enclosing scope, but not the global scope. Looking at these two versions side by side illustrates the difference between a simple assignment and using the non-local keyword. In the first version, assigning n equals to 8 inside inner makes a new local variable, separate from the n equals 3 in the outer. Running this function, we can see that the outer n remains unchanged because the inner n worked with its own local scope. In the second version, we declare non-local n. This explicitly tells Python that n refers to the variable from the nearest enclosing function, which in this case is outer. Both functions now share the same n, and updates inside the inner affect the enclosing scope. This is different from global. While global modifies variables in the module level scope, non-local is limited to the nearest enclosing function making it safer and more targeted. Now let's look at default and flexible arguments. Imagine we are writing functions that takes several inputs, and some of these inputs have the same values. It would be nice if we didn't have to type these common values every time. That's where default arguments come in. They let us set default values, so parameters are optional unless we want to change them. Let's look at an example. We have written a function with two arguments. The greeting argument has a default value of hello. If we don't provide a second argument, hello is used as you can see here. If we want to modify the greeting argument, we can do so by passing our own value as well. This will replace the default. Sometimes we don't know in advance how many arguments a function will receive. By putting a star in front of a parameter, Python collects all the extra positional arguments into a tuple. This conventionally uses the name star args, but any name works. Here we have used star numbers. This function, multiply all, loops through each element and build up the product by multiplying the values together. The function works equally well with any number of arguments. This makes star args especially useful when writing functions that must be flexible about how many inputs they accept, such as calculators, data aggregators, or wrappers. While star args collects extra positional arguments as a tuple, using two stars before a parameter collects extra keyword arguments into a dictionary. To demonstrate, we have written a function called display profile with a quark argument called profile with two stars. Calling display profile bundles the name, age, and city arguments into a dictionary. Inside the function, the keys and values of this dictionary is looping through profile.items in a flexible way. Quarks is especially useful when we don't know all the possible input attributes in advance and when we want to pass configuration data or metadata to a function. The names quarks and args are just conventions. We could name these parameters anything. The important part is single or double star. This is a powerful feature for writing adaptable functions. Traditional functions in Python are written using the def keyword, but sometimes there's a faster way for simpler functions. These are called lambda functions. Lambda functions are a shortcut for writing simple one-line functions. They use the keyword lambda, followed by parameter names, a colon, and an expression. These functions let us avoid writing a full function if all we need is something quick and concise. Let's look at this example. We have created a function where the parameters are base and exponent, and this lambda function is then assigned to raise to power, so it behaves just like any other function. Lambda functions are best for simple expressions. For more complex logic, we stick with a full def function for clarity. Lambda functions passed to the map keyword are considered anonymous, 
since they don't have explicit names. They are handy for applying simple transformations, like squaring each number in a list. In this example, we use map to apply a function to each element in nums. The inline lambda function squares the input and map applies this function to every item as shown in the output. Functions can throw errors if used incorrectly. That's a natural part of programming. Errors let us know when the code doesn't behave as expected, thus helping us catch problems quickly. Let's look at an example on error handling. The built-in function float converts numbers or number-like strings into floating point values, but only if they represent valid numbers. Passing a string that isn't a number, like hello, causes Python to raise a value error. There are many different types of error depending on what goes wrong. When we write functions, it's smart to anticipate possible errors and make the error messages helpful for future users. For example, here we wrote a function called get square root, which computes the square root of the input. Here calling the get square root function on 25 works fine because 25 is a number. But when we pass hello, Python raises a type error. This happens because Python doesn't know how to raise hello to a power. Notice that the default error message can be confusing to the end users. They may not immediately understand what went wrong. This is where error handling becomes important. A try except block allows us to catch errors and decide what to do instead of letting the program crash. The code inside the try block runs first. If an error occurs, Python jumps to the except block. In this example, instead of showing the default Python error, we raise an exception and display a clear user-friendly message. Here we have updated the original get square root function to a safe square root function. For valid inputs like 16, it returns the square root. But for invalid inputs like apple, it prints a helpful message instead of throwing an error. This shows how wrapping code in try except can make functions safer and easier for others to use. Instead of catching all errors with a broad exception keyword, as I've shown before, it's better to catch specific errors. In this version of safe square root, we have added two separate except blocks. One for type error, when the input is not a number, and one for value error, when the input is a negative number. Catching specific exceptions like this makes error handling more precise and safer. If the input is the wrong type, like a string, a type error is raised. Here the word apple raises a type error. If the input is numeric but invalid, like a negative number for a square root, a value error is raised. Here the value of minus 9 raises a value error. Catching specific errors has two main advantages. It makes our code more precise. We only handle the problems we expect. It also avoids unintentional hiding of unrelated errors that should be debugged. These improve both reliability and readability of the error handling. Notice that on line 4 we explicitly raised a custom error with the keywords raise value error. This is different from waiting for Python to raise an error automatically. We are proactively checking the input and providing a clear message. Using built-in exceptions with custom messages gives us the best of both worlds. Python's reliable error types, for example type error or value error, and our own meaningful messages for end users. With that, we have come to an end of our video on writing functions in Python. If you have learned from this video, please like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.